Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your love for us today. Father, we just pray for your guidance in our lives. We ask that during this time that your name would be exalted. We ask that the name of Jesus would be lifted up. And during this time that we would give him glory and honor and praise. We also pray for those who are sick, for those who are, are struggling right now. We ask that, that you would provide for them. We know that you are the great healer and the great provider. Father, God, we also pray for the stability around the world. We pray for, uh, for your peace. We recognize that it's only through you that we can have peace, Father. And we also pray for, th during this time, that there would be a, a great revival and a turning to you as people realize that their, their joy and their happiness cannot be found in anyone else. Yes, Father, we, just, we ask a blessing upon this time, but may you, your spirit be with us. May your presence be with us, not just in our hearts, but in, in this study. And may we draw close to you and to your throne. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 Okay, so if everyone can just mute their mics, and we'll begin the, the study. And so we are, we are beginning the first vision. So let me go ahead and read Revelation 1, verses 9 to 20. Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 20. You can see it on the screen in front of you there. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and kingdom and patient endurance that are in Jesus, was in the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw a golden lampstand, seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest. The ears of his head were white, white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp and two-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at my, his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen those which are, and those which will take place after this. And as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay, so <clears throat> I did not read the full vision. So what's, what's going to happen is the first vision is really going to be from Revelation Revelation 1, 9 to the end of chapter 3, okay? So this is just the first part of this large vision. So let's go back up here. I don't know all of this tonight. We'll try. We'll make, it, we'll make an effort here. What I want to do is, as we work through here, I'm going to start. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a blank text like this because I do want... I want the, a, a new purpose for this for this Bible study. I want I want you to be able to follow my example. I, I want I want I think everyone here has the capability to to replicate this type of study. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically for de devotionals, for for Sunday school. Maybe maybe some of you will one day preach. Uh, Ronnie, I'm thinking about you, especially, and others. And so, uh, but I'm going to start breaking out the text the way I do and when I prepare, okay? So, looking at verse 9, uh, verse 9 and following, 
you can see that the text is already broken out in paragraph form. So most of your Bibles have paragraph form. And you actually have, you have a title in your, in your, your uh, margin. What's the title for, for chapter nine that you have? Okay, I heard several things. So you have the vision of the Son of Man. What do you have, Pastor? Um, this is the Holman Brisson Bible. John's vision of the of the risen Lord. Okay, all right. So let's write let's write several things down here. So, so we have vision of the Son of Man. And then what 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 Bible is that, Luigi? What's the ESV? ESV. And then Holman, which is actually CSB, has vision of the risen Christ. Is that what it has? Uh, John's vision of the risen Lord. Okay, the okay, vision of the uh, John's vision of the risen. Okay, so I hope that we can see here that that th this is describing a big picture of what is to follow, and really this vision is is from is going to be from Revelation one nine to three verse three verse twenty nine. So if you're looking at big picture, this is the this is the first vision. Okay. Typically, we jump to the visions in chapter four, right? We go to the, we go to the other more interesting. Maybe maybe I could stand correct. I know in the past I have. You just jump to those big visions. But here, what I want to emphasize is that here is the first vision, and the first vision, quite appropriately, is a vision about describing the risen Lord or the son of man. Okay. Everyone sees that. We're going to unpack these more. All right. The next thing I'm going to do is I am going to break out the sentences. So if you're preparing a sermon or if you're, if you're doing a study and there's a lot going on, the first thing I recommend is that you just break out I'm just going to separate out per sentence. Okay. That helps. All right. So we're going to focus now on verse nine right now. Okay. Verse nine. Now, what jumps out at you? Um, what jumps out at you immediately? What are, let's let's make some let's make some identifications here. Talking like a Christian, basically calling you know brother like a brother. Okay, so so who 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 is that? John. Okay, so we have here we have here a, descri a description of John, and and who is John, Luigi? I don't, I don't understand. What do you mean? Who is John? Well, so I mean, so so making a, making a connection with our previous study, making a connection with our previous study. Who is John? Brother. Oh, okay, yeah. So it, so okay, but 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 okay. I'm not. I, I don't want to try to make this more confusing than what it is. What do we know <laughs> about the author, or what do we know about who this John is? Let's just make some quick identifications. Uh, he identifies himself. We're going to look at that in a minute. Okay. But I'm saying from our previous study right now, I really want us to, we're making connections with verses one, one to eight. Who is John according to verses one, one to eight? Anyone can jump in here. Servant. Okay. So John is identified in uh, revelation one, one to eight. He is a servant. Okay. What else? Who is he? 
He said he is a brother. Oh, great. The nine. This, uh, does it say beforehand? It's okay. So, we're, yeah. Auntie Mila, we're first looking at Revelation 1, 1 to 8, and then we'll make those identifications in, oh. in a second. Yeah. I'm just, what I'm trying to do, everyone, is that think of this as a pattern. Whenever you go to prepare a passage of scripture, now we're doing this expositionally, so we're going verse by verse, but I, I'm trying to build into us this, this uh, pattern of, of looking at the surrounding context prior to looking at the context itself, okay? So um, I'm just trying to be clear on, on what I'm asking. So we know that he's a servant. Uh, what else do we know about him? Even beyond the text, who is, who is John? Apostle? Yes. Yeah. He's an apostle. He's he's also the author, right? He's also the author. He's the author of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and he's also the one by which he's receiving this revelation. Okay. Is he John the Divine? What do you mean by John the Divine? As in the 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 one of the one of the twelve apostles? That's a that's the one who served of God. He served he servant of God. Oh. Yeah, so he would be he would be yeah, so he would be one of the twelve apostles. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. If that's what you mean by it. So I'm I'm making the connection here with especially with Revelation one one to three. Okay. So let me just read. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Okay. So I'm I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. And we talked about before that John is viewed here as this, uh, this, this, he's viewed in, uh, in the prophetic office. Okay. We're going to see this more this morning or in the evening. Okay. So this is, this is, these are some of the things that we need to consider prior to this, this first vision. Is everyone tracking with me here? What, what we're doing here? I hope I'm making sense. Okay, uh, now we're going to add. We're going to add to this understanding of who John is. And so there are, there are several things that, that uh, we need to highlight here, okay? So someone mentioned it. Uh, who mentioned it? Go ahead now. Those who want to make observations about the text itself, um, what, what do you want to say about John now? He bear the record of the word of God. Um, yeah. So, so wh where are you making that connection? Just give me the, give me the, the passage where, or, or the place where you're, you're making the connection. Okay. So, so I just, I just heard, I just heard. So in addition to being a servant, to being an apostle. So, uh, so in addition to being a servant, in addition to being an apostle, in addition to being an author, in addition to, to fulfilling this special prophetic office, John is, is called, number one, he is called a brother. And then a partner. So what is, what is quite significant when you compare, when you compare these two? What do you find very interesting? He is the witness. Oh, okay, yeah. So he is also he is also a witness. So let me just put this. Let me just move this down here. And and so he's he's called down here in many ways. He is. This is dealing with uh, a witness. But just so that everyone, I, I want to focus here. 
what do you find so interesting from from your from your experience in the church from your experience in the church maybe some of us are are from a catholic background maybe from a baptist maybe from other protestant background what do you find so interesting between i even heard someone mention john the divine right so divine that sounds so high <laughs> sounds so so reverent what do you what do you notice when you compare and contrast well when you said your brother is referring to the church he's referring to the body he's referring to us. the family yeah that's the family yeah so now this servant who received this revelation who is who has this prophetic office there is this uh close relationship as a brother a very close relationship that you almost could touch it's like just like uh, um, you, I could I could really call you as my brother and my sister. Excellent. So so in in one sense, he has been called by God to a special task. He has been given a, 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 this final revelation, this final revelatory visions through an angel directly from Jesus Christ. And there's this, you know, we would say in the, there's this highness, there's this, there's almost this, this specialness, right? This is special. He's in this category of uniqueness. And at the same time, John identifies himself in this close, equal relationship. So John views himself as the same as the churches and as both as a body and as individuals. Um, what does that say? What should that say on how we treat leadership in the church? Well, it sounds like he, although he has all this authority, he's humble about it. Yes. Excellent. Yes. So there's, there's a uh, there's there's a humility component for sure. There is a equality component. What were you saying, Beth? I, I think it goes with what you. Okay. Said there. So there's humility, equality, and so so that is relating the closest. At the same time, there should be what? There should be a level of. There's a level of respect. Yes, respect. And also concerning John, John has this great responsibility. So, so what I want us to see here as church leaders, as church members, is that there is both, we ought to respect leaders, we ought to have, um, we, all, we ought to, to, to respect what they say at the same time they they are in this position they have this great responsibility okay but at the same time there is this humility and equality that it's not a separate class of christian okay so we have to balance both of those and the other thing I want us to see here is that with respect, with respect to all of these, is the leader, does, the, does, does John have, so far in this context, who is the one who has authority? According to this context, who has authority? Even one to eight, one to eight, who is the one in authority? I heard it. Luigi, what, what was that? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, right? So notice here, re review here, we had God going to going to, to Jesus through an angel, through John. To the church, 
right? So John is just, John is just in one sense, John is also just a messenger. So we only listen to John and as far as he is giving us the word of God, okay? Now I'm kind of belaboring these points. I hope it's making sense, but I, I, do, want, I do want you to see how significant all of these different things relate and how they play out practically in our churches, okay? Um, so we have, uh, John identifies himself. So John, John considers himself as a brother. So he doesn't say, you're, you know, uh, uh, John, your father. <laughs> doesn't say that. He could have. Or your leader. Or your leader. He could have said it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, Maybe I'm stepping on some toes here, but but there is there is a, a a John is choosing to identify himself a certain way, and we need to be aware of that. So not only does John identify himself as a brother, how else does John identify himself as? Partner, partner, partner in the tribulation. <laughs> so your so your brother and partner. <laughs> So, so again, these are, these are, these are signifying a close and equal relationship. All right. Now, um, there are, um, there, there is a partnership specifically to what? So I'm going to notice here, I'm now breaking out this prepositional phrase because this is going to be quite significant, okay? So everyone can see I'm breaking out this prepositional phrase. And um, what, what is so surprising and significant about this prepositional phrase? What do you find is just, okay, so I'm looking at the prep, I'm looking at the partner and I'm looking at it in connection with the prepositional phrase. Does everyone see what I'm referring to when I say prepositional phrase? So let's make some let's make some identifications here. And again, we're connecting with the previous context. Well, it seems like three totally different things. So there's three different things, right? Um, tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. And these are these are all in connection with this partnership, right? Does this strike you as odd? Does this strike you as wow? No, I'm, I would expect this type of reference. W what are your thoughts? You know, maybe now this is more of a practical. I want us to make connections practically with the church with our conception of the church, with conception of expectations in the church, and even maybe expectations in eschatology, in what we know about Revelation. What is so striking to you? So I guess right now we're more thinking about our history of understanding end times, our context of the church. What is so striking about this statement? I, John, your your partner in tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. What strikes you as, uh, what strikes you about this? Well, just that there are three totally, to me, different things. Um, you know, the tribulation being a, an anticipation of some tough going. And then the kingdom would be some sort of um, um, objective. And then the patient endurance implies that, um, I don't know, you're going to need help to get through it. Yeah, so tribulation can be, so, no, that's good. Okay, all right. No, that's really good. So you have, you have this tribulation here. And, and so, so you're identifying this as, difficulty, a, a great difficulty to come, right? And, th and that's kind of come bringing in our, 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 
our understanding of the great tribulation, right? Is, is, is that what you're connecting it to, Bill? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, difficulty. So let's just, I'm just going to get really specific. I don't want to play, I don't want to play games here. Um, um, I'm not going to try, I'm just going to try to be as transparent as possible. So referencing the great tribulation, right? Number one. Number, number two, it's dealing with this idea of, of kingdom. And, and you said there's an, a, an objective there. Um, so let's, let's unpack that a little more. And then number three, there's this idea of patient endurance. And so you were saying it's, it's the, uh, well, how did you say it again? Just repeat what you said again. Well, I don't know if it was well thought out, but that you would need some help to get through yeah. the tribulations. Um, you need help or there needs, uh, how else can we say that? We definitely need, um, uh, there's a need for like steadfastness, right? If we could use the word steadfastness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or we could also say uh, perseverance. Now, what's really interesting to me is that coming back here, let's let's identify. Let's identify: is this present tense, future tense, or? present tense with an expectation of future tense. There's three options here. Uh, I, think I think it's a ladder. It's a combination of both. Uh, 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 about the tribulation I'm looking at maybe because there was a, a great persecution happening, you know, and I don't know if that's the one that John was talking about, the tribulation they're going through that he was telling his, uh, his audience or his readers that I am with you. I am, I am, I am uh, not live, abandoning you in your experience because you know, you know how he, how he came about in the island of Patmos. Yeah. So he was telling them or affirming them that I am with you even in this tribulation we're going through. And then, and I am with you with a kingdom that's about to come, you know? No, and I am with you and doing and doing with you as well. You know, kind of. That's what I. Uh, I yeah. so, look at it. No, so 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 there. So I, I like what what Mill is saying that there are three different. There are three different things. There are three different things. Okay, they're very they're very different in one sense, but they're also interrelated. Okay, so if we view them as different as distinct but interrelated. So these are related, these are related, and, and then this is related. Do you see how that, do you see how all of these play in? Th think about this for a second. In Revelation, how many kingdoms are there in Revelation? I'm thinking really big picture. Seven. Huh? Just one, right? One. Well, there's there's two, right? There's the kingdom of oh, of, of the of darkness, and there's or the, the kingdom uh, of the, enemy, uh, the kingdom uh, of the beast, and there's the kingdom of God, right? So there's there's in Revelation, there's at least two kingdoms, right? So if there's two kingdoms, there's gonna be warfare, right? When within warfare, so warfare, you have tribulation, right? If you're looking at this relationship, you can see warfare, right? And so you see how the three interrelate, right? Is everyone, is everyone tracking? Is everyone tracking with me there? Um, let me just read one passage. So, so I'm cheating. I'm going to sneak ahead and read into the future. Okay. So, because again, we can just make speculations later. We'll see these come together, but I do reading, 
uh, Revelation, uh, we, we talked about exegetically in context. Okay, so so look at Revelation. I, let me just read one passage here, or, or several passages here. Um, Revelation chapter 11, uh, verse 15. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. <laughs> so there's, there's clearly this warfare going on where the kingdom of the world be, uh, is conquered and, and is taken over by the kingdom of the Lord and his Christ, and he reigns forever, okay? So, so, so clearly, uh, um, there is this warfare going on, okay? Um, <clears throat> any comments or questions or thoughts or... I hope this is making sense. Let let me read now. Let me read for you because I what I, I I'm gonna read I'm gonna read three other path two other passages in other parts of the scripture to, to kind of bring this to bear. So so if you want you can turn to John. I don't have time to put it up on the screen, but we can go to John chapter sixteen. John chapter sixteen. Verses 33, John 16, 33 says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Okay, so that's the same author. And he's, and, and he's quoting Jesus who says, you're going to have tribulation. John is one of the 12 disciples. Now he's an apostle, and he says to the churches, your partner in tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. And so there is definitely this present component of present tribulation. Okay? The next passage I want to read to you is 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Let, let me begin in verse eight. So I'm. This is very. This is uh, Paul speaking to, to Timothy. Remember Jesus, the Messiah, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as I preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering tribulation. Okay, bound with chains as a criminal. So the connection there is that Paul is proclaiming the gospel. Uh, and he's experiencing tribulation. He's experiencing suffering. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure. <laughs> so you have, you have tribulation. You have endurance. Okay, so, uh, so right there you have tribulation. You have patient endurance. So even though he's experiencing tribulation, he's enduring. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm submitting to you that you also have kingdom because he's proclaiming the word of God. He's preaching the gospel. And even though he's experiencing tribulation and patient endurance, uh, the, the gospel is not bound. In other places, the gospel is referred to as the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew, Matthew 24, 14. But just watch. Uh, Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain salvation that is in Jesus the Messiah. So Messiah is, again, a kingdom reference. The Messiah is the reference to the, the offspring of David, kingdom language, right? We also have that in verse 8. Uh, that is in Jesus the Messiah with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy. So put this in the bank. Take it to the bank. The saying is trustworthy. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign. <laughs> so endurance, patient endurance, reigning, kingdom. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I, what I want to see here is that I think 2 Timothy 2.2 2 gives us the present context. Of, of suffering... Kingdom endurance. 
And in this, and in this context, um, this is connected to, uh, to, to proclaiming the gospel. And this leads to tribulation and there's a need for endurance. Okay. Now what I what I'm not trying to say is that is that I'm not trying to say that in 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 John in John in John's mind he's quoting Apostle Paul. Okay? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that is that these are two analogous contexts uh, that are that are teaching the same truths, uh, but coming from different people. Okay, does that make sense? I'm not saying that on in John's mind he's thinking about Second Timothy two two explicitly. Okay, they're just teaching the same truths, and and in many ways, uh, Paul is giving us his experience, which is actually the same as John's. It's similar. Is everyone tracking with me? Is everyone there with me? And so the, the final connection is that is that here we go. Um, the proof is in the pudding. John is John is on the island of Patmos. So this is John's location. And this is the reason. The word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Paul says the gospel. <laughs> now, I submitted to you before, we've heard this phrase before, right? In, in Revelation 1.3, I would write this cross-reference down in your study. John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so someone brought up this witness theme, which was spot on. I, I, I'm glad that they did. Uh, that this is uh, a, a witness theme. And this is coming directly from Revelation 1, verse, verse 2. So John is a partner in tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. What is his proof? Because he's on the island of, of Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This is in exile. This is like a prison camp. Let's, let's ask the question. Based upon this, Based upon this, um, I don't want us to bring in our other theology, and perhaps we can be corrected, okay? Perhaps we can be corrected as we continue to read Revelation, but let's think specifically about our eschatology, um, because, because the immediate pointing to, Mill brought up the, you can't help it, when he says tribulation, we're thinking great tribulation right that's the this is foreshadowing the great tribulation correct is that correct is everyone seeing that is uh do you think that we're going to be in it or not what does this seem to be saying to us i think tribulation will never end until jesus christ Come back until the, the judgment day. That's how I understand it. So it's 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 present and it's ongoing and will continue until Jesus returns. That's one observation. Yes. Excellent. So Can you repeat your question again, Tim? What's your question? 
So my, my question essentially is I'm, I'm reflecting upon the, the, this truth, these truths in relationship to what we know about revelation, what our expectations are about revelation, uh, what type of practical, is this new for you? You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm, this is all, ab, this is all like, okay, abstract, but I want us to, I want us to, to join in with this, with, with the text. What is your reaction? Uh, Tim, so is what you're saying is, is, is what John's defining here. We as Christians, we, we're, we're living this today. Yes, that's one application. So he, we are, we are in partner with John in tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. That, that this is definite and absolute. Excellent. So let's write this down first. So, so this is uh, definite and absolute because it's uh, uh, because it's in the pre it's happening because it is happening. And then uh, uh, this partnership is for <laughs> us. <laughs> we, we are in this partnership. Let, let me read one passage to kind of bring this to bear because some people... So I'll be I'll be specific. A lot of people will say there is a there is a, a an eschatology that says we're not present in the in revelation. All of the visions, in in no way are we present during during it. Okay, um, this the, with with John speaking in this type of language, it does seem hard to believe that in writing to the churches, in his mind. The church is not going to be present in what is to come. Does everyone see what I'm saying? It just to me that is a very hard read. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? What I'm saying? L let me read one other passage of scripture. So this is in Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 to 13. Okay. Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. This is just an example text, okay? And so the question is, um, should we just discard this as not applying to us? How should we read this? Here is the call for endurance of the saints. So to me, it's like literally echoing back John's introduction. Here is the call for endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Revelation chapter. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 14. Verses. 12. To 13. Here is the call for endurance of the saints. So let's I'm going to mark this up really quick. I want you to see this, okay? So there is a there is a call. There is a call and what? For endurance of the saints. Purpose. We come right to be quiet. Um we have endurance. So this is from Revelation 1 8, 1 9, right? 1 9 and both here and here, right? You have uh, endurance and you have saints. And then he's going to further define, because some people will say, oh, saints just refers to, to Israel that's now believing in Revelation, okay? It's just for Israel that's now believing, okay? Is everyone tracking with me? But the, the description here doesn't reference Israel. It's all those who, number one, keep the commandments, and number two, number two have faith in Jesus. <laughs> Only two. So, uh, who are the saints? Those who keep God's commandments and faith in Jesus. Uh, your brother and partner in tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance, which are in Jesus. I, I see this as being a reference to the church. Here is the call. 
Listen, here's the call for the endurance of the saints. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed, write this, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Now, I'm not trying to scare anyone. I am, I am, trying, I am trying to help us to um, uh, read Revelation <laughs> because there's a blessing in the reading, in the hearing, and the obeying. Okay? And so here we have a clear example of, of John calling himself a partner in tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance that are in Jesus Christ. He's suffering on Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And then in Revelation chapter 14, where there is a theology that says we will not, that, that, that we, the church will not be here. Okay. This does not apply to the church. And yet there is a, a explicit command to endurance of the saints. In Revelation 14, 12 to 13. Okay. So I'm trying to I'm trying to force us to think. I'm trying to force us to to think about this theologically and practically. Okay. Coming back to this text, these three things are directly connected to one thing that are in Jesus. Okay? So this is not tribulation and patient endurance concerning our sin. This is not tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance considering other types of, of difficulties. This is difficulties specifically related to our being Christians. So, so, so this is tribulation in reaction to our being Christians. John experienced, uh, is experiencing uh, exile because of the word of God and the testimony. God is not punishing him, okay? So God is not, God is not doing it to him in the sense that God is, uh, God's judgment is not upon, okay. I, I'm good. I, we're good, okay. <laughs> so let's move on to verse 10 and 11. So, so uh, <laughs> what I want us to see here is that up until now, Revelation 1, 1 to 8, and now we're getting into the first vision. We're really having the table set for the rest of the book. We cannot read. We cannot have our own theological systems apart. This is setting up how we read the rest of the book. Okay? So verse number 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to those in Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. What is significant here? Anything that jumps out at you? I'll make, I'll make an observation here that you can research on your own time. We don't have time to go there. But this statement, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. This, this goes right back to the, the Lord and Moses in Exodus 19 and 20. When the Lord comes to Moses and, and he speaks to him with a loud voice like a trumpet. <laughs> especially Exodus 19:16. But now but now we have Jesus. Now we have 
Jesus speaking to John. So, so, so what? So, some significance is here, is that this is the a, a prophetic context. Moses is 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 the prophet of the Lord. He's receiving revelation from the Lord, and so now John is receiving revelation from Jesus. So there is number one prophetic context. This is revelatory. This is also supporting the, the divinity of Christ. And, and Jesus is, is being uh, compared with the Lord. In the same way that the Lord came to Moses. Jesus is now coming to John. It's very powerful. This is also, this is also, this is also analogous to Ezekiel. So your homework is to look at Ezekiel, these passages here. Ezekiel 2.2, 2, Ezekiel 3.12, 14 and 24, 11, 1, and 43.5. Let me, let me clarify here. So Ezekiel is definitely a prophet. So if we're if we're familiar with the Old Testament, if we're really familiar with the with the, the prophets, this event should jump out to us as incredibly significant. Okay. And notice the commands here. The commands here are to write and to send. what you see. So this comes back to the vision, the visionary nature of Revelation. These are visions. So it, it, it's not that John is getting the IMAX, <laughs> the IMAX video footage of live events in the future, okay? We tend to think of it like that. The visions, if you read in Ezekiel, he has visions that signify uh, uh, other spiritual truths that aren't. Uh, the vision is not as literal in the sense it's conveying truth, but it's not literal in the sense that the vision literally is, is showing what's happening in, in its literal sense, okay? Is everyone tracking with what I'm saying here? And, and really what needs to happen is you need to read Ezekiel. You're, if you have home, if you have time, okay, I would read Ezekiel and especially these passages to see how much of a parallel. And then, then you tell me if Ezekiel, if the visions in Ezekiel could be literally literal one-to-one -one or are these visions teaching literal spiritual truths? Is, is everyone tracking with what I'm saying there? I'm, I'm not getting a lot of feedback from people, so I, I hope I, I hope people are. It's getting late. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Okay, we're we're gonna end it. We're gonna end it right now. Um. So what I, what I want I want to say. Hey, I got a question. Yeah. Hey Tim. So this all these visions that John's experiencing is happening, I guess, in the beginning of verse ten. It's, it's all happening in one day. Um, particularly Sunday. Yeah, so we're going to see that. We're going to see that, and 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 the answer to that would be most likely yes. I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, 
there's a series of visions that he's going to receive. Yes. This will be the first of several visions. Multiple visions. So it's like uh, John is binge watching the vision. <laughs> binge, binge watching. So, so something you can do, Paulo, is look for this phrase. Everyone can do this. In Revelation, look for this phrase. And then I saw. That phrase is going to happen throughout. So the first vision is Revelation 1 to chapter 3. Revelation chapter 4. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was standing, and a voice said, the, uh, the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So, so there's this, and then I saw, right? After this, I looked. Um, uh Chapter 10, then I saw, chapter, chapter 7, after this I saw. So yeah, so, so these, are, these are a series of visions, and yeah, binge watching, however you want to say it. <laughs> want to say it. Um, so there's a series of visions, and he's writing this all to, and I want to close on this. He's sending it to the seven churches. He's sending what you see. This is going to the seven churches. Okay. Why Everyone? only seven? So then, so then this Does comes. Does he want to go to sleep or not? <laughs> so then this comes back to remember what we talked about before. Seven. There, there. These are these are seven literal churches. But seven is the number of completion, so this signifies the whole church. Seven, so just like the seven spirits that are before the throne, right? Not, it's not that there's seven different spirits. It's that, uh, is that these seven churches are representing all of the church of all time, okay? So it's meant to be received by more than just these seven churches. It must be received by more than just the seven churches. It's for all the church. Um, but each of these seven churches, there's a context, okay? And so Jesus is addressing these seven historic churches, but, but the message is meant to be conveyed beyond, okay? Is everyone tracking with me there? So I want you to consider Revelation 1, 4. It says seven churches. And then also Revelation, uh, uh, yes, also part of 4. This is seven churches and also seven spirits. The last thing I want to say is, again, the focus of Revelation, it's, I mean, it's written to the churches. So, so, for, so for us, now perhaps a, a view where we're not going to be present in Revelation 4 through 20, you know, that could still be proven. But for us to discard all of those as we're not going to be there is, is you have a massive hurdle exegetical hurdle to do because it seems to be that John is preparing is preparing the church for this both in the their, their partners in the present and he's preparing the church Jesus is preparing the church for what is to come oh, is everyone tracking with me there it, it seems to be preparing the church okay um uh this lastly before we go in here is that this is in um, this is referring to Jesus, uh, to, to John in the state of, he's in a state of worship, and it is on the Lord's Day, which would be Sunday, okay? So we can debate that if you want, but it's a reference to um, uh, worship on, on Sunday, on the ex, on, uh, exiled on Patmos, Okay.
Anything else or is that, is that all? Are we good? This is, this is just a lot to take in, right? It's a lot to take in. Uh -huh. <laughs> Everyone is waiting for the, the actual vision because that's where the, uh, the action is. Uh -huh. So I've been like, it's like five weeks in and yeah. you still haven't gotten into the action, okay? I, 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 it's coming, but what I want us to do is, I'm going to close on this really quick, is that I want us to be reassessing our own place in the book, okay? I want us to be considering our place in the book because, again, there is that blessedness that is attached. And um, so, yeah, so I'll turn this over to Pastor right now.